welcome to Just Minding My Business Radio, where we are moving at the speed of God, learning what we didn't know we didn't know. I'm your host, Ida Crawford. And I'm your co-host, Ruth Haskins. So grab a pen and paper and get ready for information that you can use. Welcome to Just Minding My Business Media, LLC. We hope your day is one of fulfilled possibilities because you know your worth and the value of what you do. Consider product placement with Just Minding My Business Media, LLC. With our presence on all major podcast platforms with listeners in over 200 countries, visit our website at jmmbmediallc.com to discover other digital products to 10X your business. Contact us also at jmmbradio at gmail.com. That's jmmbradio at gmail.com. Today, we welcome Paulina Neal, who is an international women's leadership coach. Paulina lectures for MBA programs and delivers training for UN leaders at the United Nations System Staff College as well as to corporate clients. She is the founder of Unabridged, a leadership development practice providing coaching for women and women's leadership workshop series. She also founded Mentoring Exchanges, a mentoring service that matches international development professionals with global executives and academics. Welcome, Polina. Thank you so much. I am delighted to be here with both of you. We are delighted to have you, Kalina. It is definitely a welcome all the way from Paris, France. Wow. We, what a reach. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. I'm so happy to be here with both of you. So how did you get involved with the women's leadership? What led you on that path? Oh, that's a great question. It's a big question, but a great question. I think I'll share two important milestones in my journey that that's brought me here. So the first one is really when I set up my leadership development practice. And I did that when I moved from Ethiopia, where I was living and working to France about 12 years ago. And the transition from Ethiopia to France at the time was definitely a challenge on many different levels. And I did what I normally do when things get challenging. I went back to my spiritual home, which for me is education, and I trained as a leadership coach. Now, this was such a powerful and exciting experience for me. I found it personally and professionally transformative. I wanted to share this with everyone, and especially the people who worked in my space, global development. And so what I decided to do is I decided to combine my 20 some years of experience working in organizational development with coaching. And that's what led me to create my leadership development practice called Unabridged. So that was the first piece. And from there, the second milestone, and I just love this because this is what really really anchored myself, I guess, myself in in women's leadership. This came during my first coaching experience. So I was coaching a group of clients. And by, by randomly, I would say randomly, they subdivided into two groups. So I had on the one hand, I had this group of very experienced, successful, educated women, many of them were already leading multi multi million dollar projects around the world. And in this other group, I had a group of much more junior and often younger men who had very little work experience. Some of them didn't have any or maximum three years. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them were just finishing either their MBA or some sort of master's program. And so what was happening is when I was coaching the women, they never talked about themselves as leaders or their leadership. And the men, on the other hand, talked about their leadership from the very first coaching session and how they could go further and faster. 
So for me, what seemed to be happening is that the women didn't self-identify as leaders. They just talked about getting the work done. And the men saw themselves as leaders right from the get-go. And so I became really curious. For me, this represented not only a fascinating, but also a worrying conundrum. And I really wanted to know more about what was going on here, what makes women, what supports or undermines women to, to self-identify as leaders, and what might this mean for them and their leadership, or how other people see them as leaders. Mm -hmm. And so it was really this that led me to dedicate my practice to women's leadership. And for me, this is really my purpose, my passion, and quite frankly, a privilege. So that's that's what brought me to where I am today. Wow. And that's funny that you saw that distinction between the women and the men. So why do you think that's so? Oh, gosh, I, I think there's a lot of different reasons why women have trouble self-identifying as leaders. Now, to be fair, clearly this doesn't happen for every woman, but this was what was showing up in my practice. So I think that there's all sorts of barriers that can get in our way. I, I like to think of it as a constellation of reasons why we have less women in, in leadership spaces, but also why sometimes it's harder for them to identify. So, you know, we have things like social, cultural, gender norms, mm -hmm. and we, you know, as you know, we just celebrated International Women's Day on Tuesday, yes. where we talked about bias. And so that's a huge issue. Um, I think things like the double burden um, and, and for those of you who might not be familiar with that term, that's often referred to as those difficulties that women experience when they're trying to navigate that sweet spot between competence and likability, because we know that if you're too competent, you can suffer a likability penalty for not being feminine enough. And if you're too nice, you can then suffer a competency penalty and be dismissed. So that that can get in the way um a lot of times exact yes exactly wow yeah yes. sometimes we have that um any time anywhere imperative where where leaders are expected to be on call 24 7 and also expected to to transfer and for women who have caregiving responsibilities whether that's their family or children that can make it very difficult. So there's all sorts. And then of course there's, you know, personal choice. And sometimes the, I would say unhelpful myths or limiting beliefs that we as individuals hold. So there's a whole constellation of reasons. And I think it's important to note that it really does depend on the individual woman. Can we talk for just a moment about, um, I think what you're talking about is lovely because it's coming up now, it was needed years ago, oh. but no one ever thought that it was important. They figured that, you know, we can do anything you can do better, kind of like <laughs> kind of the attitude that we had. <laughs> you know, and so we, we stepped into this huge arena, oh. not knowing all the little nuances that go on in those positions. Mm. So we didn't even, we weren't even aware of our limiting beliefs. Can you talk a little bit to that? Oh, absolutely. And again, this is this is not to suggest that every woman has them, but you know, certainly in my practice, lots of times limiting beliefs can be at work. I whether we call them myths or limiting beliefs. So one of the ones that I'd love to share with you, and this is the one that by far comes up the most frequently in my practice, is this limiting belief around, well, my work should speak for itself. And this is a tricky one. Mm. So if I just share an anecdote with you, I think that might help get, give some clarity. So oftentimes women will come to coaching with some version of this story. I'm a talented, experienced lawyer, doctor, cloud engineer, marketing exec, and I just got passed over for, for promotion. Some young guy in our department got the job that I had wanted. 
you know, I can run circles around him technically. I have no idea what's going on. I'm so frustrated. I feel like quitting. And so when we unpack some of this, because clearly there's lots of things going on, but when we unpack this, what often comes out is this, this, I call it a dangerous myth that my work should have spoke for itself and propelled me into that particular position. Now, to be fair, this strategy actually did work for us in school and university. It was pretty simple, you know, good work meant a good grade. Mm -hmm. However, as we know, the recipe for success and organizational life is so much more complicated. Yes, it is. Exactly. And, and then if we think about not only the recipe for success, which includes things like advancement and transitions into leadership, we also know that that requires a range of skills and competencies, including your ability to make yourself and your work visible. So wow. what, what happens sometimes is if, if you only rely on the success strategy of my work should speak for itself, and you don't use or develop any other tools, then what can happen is that you run the risk of being overlooked or disadvantaged, which can be very problematic. Yes, yes. yeah, that's a lot. Okay, so I got so many questions. Yeah. Okay, so how do you support women in, in recognizing these, these different attributes that must be a part of being recognized as a leader? Oh, that's another great question. Well, I think, you know, if we, if I just, for example, stay with that same myth, I mean, the first thing we want to do is, is challenge and update or even replace that belief. So for example, if, if I ask somebody to think about, okay, well, you know, how is that success strategy working for you? Bearing in mind that they're usually just coming to coaching after a very painful experience where they have been overlooked. What starts to happen is people then start to challenge this idea that, okay, you know, organizational life does require more. And what we're doing is we're actually creating some space to invite in new ways of being new ways of knowing new ways of working and then we can we can start to play with okay what kinds of tools might you want to add to your leadership toolbox that that are going to help you amplify you your work your leadership and so then we start to look at very practical ways and oftentimes that takes us into conversations about being visible about building relationships about networking and so what we're really, we're trying to do in this particular case and, and many others is really identifying this particular myth as, as l a limited success strategy at best, and then look for some things that they can actually do to help them move forward and amplify their, their contributions. Mm, I love it. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that's really what looking at the whole situation differently. <clears throat> Yeah. Absolutely. Another myth that comes up quite frequently is I don't fit the profile. Mm -hmm. And that taps into things like gender and culture norms. And that's really interesting, I find too. And so, you know, what I always like to start off with is a little bit of education around that. So we know already that there, you know, the research tells us and most women's live many women's lived experience experiences tell them that there is this perceived incompatibility between gender and and the leadership stereotype <laughs> so you know we know leaders are expected to be confident and aggressive and ambitious and decisive and active and and that's actually more closely aligned with the male stereotype mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so very practically speaking that can make it really difficult for some people you know women introverts, people from certain cultures to see themselves as, as leaders, or even want to be seen as leaders, if that's what they have to embody, if they think that's exactly. what they have to embody. And then that in turn affects how others see them. So once again, you know, if, if that's what's at work, what we really want to try and do is, is start to interrogate leadership a little bit. 
and look at leadership mm -hmm. as a dynamic construct, not something that's static, something that's actually evolved over the, the last 3000 years. And when we start to look at how leadership, for example, has evolved from, you know, that very command and control kind of model of leadership to one that's much more focused on influencing others towards the achievement of goals, mm -hmm. that there is an example. Mm -hmm. And what I also like to, to call in, and I think of this as almost, um, you know, one of one benefit of COVID, I think most people have had the experience to see a change in leadership during the, the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Leaders have been called upon to be adaptable, be empathetic, mm -hmm. be resilient, yes. which, yes, exactly. So again, we see movement, change, and dynamism. And, mm -hmm. and when we see that, we can see, again, there's space to, to welcome in other expressions of leadership and other voices. Yeah. And a lot of times, for women and and other groups that can feel so empowering yes mm -hmm. mm. you know i can imagine that that even feels empowering for some men because not all men yes. are you know linebackers you know, that's, no. that's not their their nature and no. as a rule sometimes in the past they got written off as you know oh he he's, he does not have the right quote unquote right stuff and it has nothing to do with, you know, sexuality. It's just that they are looked at as someone who just doesn't have that right stuff. So what I'm really hearing is that there is coming a time where people are more balancing the male and the female within themselves. There's a balance being developed where women can be not necessarily aggressive unless we actually have to. Now, when it comes to our children, yeah, there's nothing more fierce than a woman and her children, okay? Mm -hmm. um, but there's a balance. We're beginning to say, okay, I do have that some masculine tendencies in me. And men are saying, oh yeah, I do have some feminine ten tendency in me and it's okay. Because when it comes into the leadership position, you need to have both. It's like becoming, yes. we're becoming complete. Oh, beautiful. Absolutely beautiful, Ruth. I couldn't have said that better myself. And, and for this particular myth, that's why I often stress that it's not just for women. It, it hits people, you know, it could be women, it could be introverts, men and women, mm. uh, cultures, people of certain cultures. You're absolutely right. This is not just something that affects women. I also coach men who have issues with this as well and, and how to, to develop their leadership when they have a different profile that doesn't conform to this, you know, whether it's a toxic version of masculinity or not. So you're absolutely right. And this idea of, of getting that balance is so important. And I love your analogy of becoming complete and whole. That's, that's perfect. That's so wise. And how do people get in touch with you? <clears throat> well, I the first port of call is I have a, a website uh, which people can access. It's www.unabridgedleadership, one word, unabridgedleadership.com. And then I'm also available via email. And that is Paulina, P-A-L-E-N-A, -E at unabridgedleadership.com if people are interested in knowing more. I always encourage people to, I have, I, I try to put up resources regularly on my website because I think it's so important that people have access to, to different resources to, to help them continue their leadership journey. Yes, absolutely. And can I say something, just one thing, I, this is for our audience, uh, do not think that just because she is in Paris, France, that she is unavailable to you if you're listening from the United States or any other country. You know, that's mm -hmm. the beauty that we have right now uh, to be able to reach out to people who we vibe mm -hmm. with. And if you're looking for a coach, you know, really take time to consider what it is that you need. And if you're mm -hmm. in a position and you need a 
women's leadership coach. Um, here's one for you. If this is where you're going down, if you need this help, if this is what you need, I don't care where you are. Now, let me ask you, I just put you all over the, all over the globe. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I, I your permission. <laughs> well, I was going to say, Ruth, well, so, so thank you. But the irony is, is that I've, so I started my practice virtually before COVID. So I was doing this virtually because all my clients are all over the globe. They always have been, given that I have worked so much in the global development with organizations like UN, um, Save the Children, these kind of organizations, people are all over. So I've, I, very rarely have people in my time zone. <laughs> okay. All right. So she's available, folks. Exactly. Wow. Yeah. And that's lovely. That's, that is very that's lovely. lovely. Yes. Yeah. And, and being in that international space mm. is because you're dealing with, you're dealing with almost every walk of life, nationality. Mm. Mm -hmm. you know and like you say beliefs cultural mm -hmm. things that's really a lot to say the least because it's one thing to deal with people in your immediate immediate community but you're dealing with communities all over the world so how do you how do you what does that look like for you mm. oh great question well i think that when we're talking about, for example, developing our leadership, um, we always want to think about where we're starting from. So everyone's different. And that's what I love about it. So, you know, where are you starting from? Where do you want to go and grow? What do you want your leadership to look like? This differs between women um, but there's still, and, and certainly around countries as well, but there's still some overarching things that we always want to pay attention to when we're thinking about, you know, developing or refining our leadership. So that's what I think is so unifying and powerful. So for example, when I'm talking to people about developing their leadership, you know, I always talk about taking making and taking time to to reflect and plan that's such an important step of of developing our leadership and that's applicable to to anyone anywhere and oftentimes especially busy executives may, men or women have trouble finding time so that's a really important step is taking that time to think about your leadership you know what do you want it to look like in relation to your personality your values your goals your context because that's that's what's important and that's what allows you to to bring in or i guess to navigate the difference because you're actually trying to create spaces for each person to express their individual leadership style. And I love that. Mm -hmm. You know, it, similarly, when we're thinking about our leadership, you want to spend a little bit of time thinking about where you are now. And that's going to, you know, th these steps tend to be steps that are applicable to, to everyone in, who are interested in upping their leadership game. What kind of support do you need? What do you have in your organization? What can you draw down on? And if you don't have anything, what else can you, you know, can you bring or, or source? And then this idea of making a plan. So those kind of things transcend any sort of boundary, I would say. Mm -hmm. Similarly, then, you know, if you think about what else you can do, you think about, okay, I want to now move into the action phase. You're going to, it's important to spend some time experimenting and practicing. So whoever you are, and this is the beauty of it, we're all in the same boat you're going to have maybe a new skill or style or behavior that you either want to develop or refine. So again, you, you have the opportunity to practice that or, or there'll be a part of that, a part of your journey. And you, know, you also want to think about, okay, how can I connect to, to a community? And it's so important for everyone to remember in their leadership journey that number one, they're not alone, but number two, leadership is a contact sport. 
you know, we, it's all about connecting with others, yes. you know, and we know that, and that's so important. And not only is that wonderful to connect for some very, you know, pragmatic reasons, it's a way to also, you know, up your networking skills, but you also feel less alone. And by doing that, you also have the opportunity to gather intelligence and sometimes even really important information for you and your journey. So, you know, again, everyone's going to be doing that in their own unique way. And then, you know, the, another piece that's transversal is making sure that you're sustaining this. You want to sustain your leadership practice as well as your energy and your self-care, which we don't talk about enough when we talk about mm -hmm. our leadership development. Mm -hmm. You know, consolidate your lessons and your learnings. Maybe you want to do that in a learning journal, or I ask my clients to start a leadership journal. You know, think about what you learned this week, what you'd like to take forward, what you'd like to let go of, because we don't have to pay attention to everything. So being intentional about what we do, and, and this is also a way to not only, you know, help our learning, but it, we manage our energy when we start being intentional about what we're going to do. Mm. And it's still, you know, in this, in this space as well, we also want to celebrate our successes. And this is a step so many people want to skip. And it's so important, because not only does it feel good and fill us with positive energy, and that's great in and, in and of itself, but I also think that what sometimes people don't realize is that when we celebrate our successes, we're actually creating a more realistic picture of ourselves and our progress. And so we're having, we're bringing more self-awareness to our journey. And, and when we do that, we're exercising our emotional intelligence muscle, which is a key leadership competency. So there's just, you know, all of these things tr um, transcend. I was trying to think of the word in, in English. They transcend countries and cultures they're things that all of us can do to improve yeah. our leadership wherever we're leading wow this is so important yeah. mm. we need you in the white house <laughs> 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 because i think that al you know i don't know if they have it maybe they do but i think leadership needs to be able to go through these things like that you Absolutely. know especially you run in a country you know, it's a that's a heavy that's a heavy load. Number one, absolutely. And you need to be able to connect with someone that can help you work from the inside out. Really mm -hmm. help you look at what's going on, pretty much every day. <laughs> yes. Exactly. It's a, it's a daily a daily work on. It really so is daily work on. It and, is. I mean, it's just. And it's, it's a constant thing, you know, to paying attention to how you're showing up, you oh. know, making sure that, you know, you're in alignment with who mm -hmm. you are mm -hmm. and what you want to give to the people that you serve. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. And I thank you so much, Ida, for bringing up that notion of service, because leadership is about service. Mm -hmm. It's about having an other focus it's not about our ego and the i it's about creating more leaders and empowering more people and the other thing you mentioned i just want to circle back to because i think it was so important and again thank you for bringing it up is it isn't a one-off investment it's something that we do it we're, we're works in progress and Refining our leadership is like any other practice, whether we're talking about yoga or, or getting fit, it's something that we have to invest in over time, mm -hmm. in order to refine. So we're all we always have the opportunity to continue the journey. Mm -hmm. Yes, always. And I think and should I want really to enjoy it. And should mm -hmm. want to. Yes, indeed. And I think yes. so often as we look more and more at the world and really pay attention to people's actions, uh, mm -hmm. the fact that their actions and their words are sometimes just totally at opposite ends, you know, and mm -hmm. that's probably because of what Ida brought up. They are not in alignment with themselves. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. they can't be in alignment with anything else. So they just put out whatever is needed. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, we're really in a place where you can almost say that everybody needs coaching. Everybody needs coaching at some level. There are very few of us who could say that we don't need somebody else's um, ears on our conversation, our life, and our feelings. Because we can get very jumbled in this world. All you have to do is open up your eyes and in the morning, listen to the news, mm -hmm. and you're done for. That's such an important observation, Ruth. And I completely agree. And I'm not, you know, that's not just because I'm a coach. I, I, I partake in coaching myself. Mm -hmm. I, I partake in coaching supervision. I, I agree. I don't think that we, we weren't built to do it alone. No, we were not. <laughs> we were not built to do it alone. And I think that the more we can connect in different ways, including through mechanisms, whether it be coaching or mentoring or sponsorship or allyship or simply more informal connections, that benefits us and our personal and professional growth. Absolutely. I mean, you cannot get away from it. And anybody that thinks that's true, they're really not paying attention because successful people have people around them. They have... Mm -hmm people, you know, helping to make everything to come together. So if you just look at that, that already tells you, you can't do it by yourself. No, absolutely. Leadership, you know, I always come back to this metaphor. Leadership is a full-on contact sport and it's all about bumping into people in, in different ways. Yes, That's absolutely. what it's all about. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I like that. Leadership is a contact sport. Yes. Very good. I definitely remember that one, Polina. So, good. Again, how do people get in contact with you? Well, my website at unabridgedleadership.com. They can email me at Polina, P A L E N A at unabridgedleadership.com. I have a number of different mechanisms on the website in terms of how they can get in touch. And I'm always happy to, to have chats. I always encourage people to, to download resources. I also, I, I contribute, you know, I, I put out a monthly blog myself, but I also am a, an active contributor to Forbes and Psychology Today. So there's a lot of resources that I, I try to make available so that more people have access to tools that can help them develop their leadership along the way. This is what's so important to me. Absolutely. And at the end of the day, we all want to be better than we were yesterday. Absolutely. And that's just keeping it simple and keeping it real. <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Kalina, for gracing us today. We really appreciate you. And we are looking forward to more. This will, need, oh. this will not be our last collaboration. Wonderful. <laughs> I want to say a huge thank you to both of you for inviting me on the show and also your, your very insightful comments and, and questions. That's been very helpful and certainly enriches me. So thank you very much. Well, you've enriched us just as well. Yeah. As well. So thank, thank you so you. much, my dear. And my let's, pleasure. Let's do this again. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for tuning in to Just Minding My Business Radio. I'm your host, Ida Crawford. And I'm your co-host, Ruth Haskins. We hope you enjoy the show and appreciate you stopping by. Many blessings to you and yours.